Good evening, everyone. I'm Jeff Spurgeon from WQXR. Welcome to our special program tonight with cellist Stephen Esserlis and pianist Shai Wozner. We welcome those of you here in the Jerome L. Green performance space and those of you watching on uh, our uh, live web stream as well. The eminent British cellist Stephen Esserlis has performed and recorded all over the world, winning accolades and awards along the way, including a CBE, Commander of the British Empire, a chivalric order, uh, awards for his recordings, especially his recording of the solo cello sonatas of Bach, one of which you saw in that exclusive video. Uh, he did it just for us um, a few months ago. And, um, and he's also won prizes for his work in music education. So we'll talk to him a little bit about that, about reaching the next generation with this great music. He is an author and an educator and a deeply passionate musician. The young Israel-born pianist Shai Wozner is sought after on the solo concert stage and also for his wonderful collaborations in chamber music. He's playing Beethoven this season. Who isn't? But he's playing Beethoven, certainly. Um, has several April dates in New York at the 92nd Street Y. And with the People's Symphony Series, we may ask him about that at Touch 2 at Washington Irving High School. And also with the Brooklyn Chamber Music Society, too. We are very excited to present these two artists to you. And they're going to begin with Beethoven tonight, who wrote five sonatas for cello and piano. This is the second of them, performed by cellist Stephen Ursulis and pianist Shai Wozner. Please welcome them to the green space. Thank you. 
So that piece of music um, came to be because Beethoven, at the age of 25, was on tour. And he went to Berlin and played for the Prussian king, Frederick II. And there he heard a couple of cello hotshots from Paris. They were uh, brothers, the Duport brothers, Jean-Pierre and Jean-Louis. And Beethoven liked their playing so much that he wrote his first two cello sonatas um, for them and premiered them with one or the other of the brothers. We're not quite sure who, who played, played the thing. Um, and then uh, Jean-Pierre wrote a book of cello studies. And Stephen, I wondered, did you work from the, that list of etudes, that book of etudes? No. Okay. <laughs> Definitely not. Have you seen them? Are they? Are yes, I've seen them. I've even seen them, I think, on, in my box of cello studies that hasn't been opened in um, 30 years. You appear to have survived without them, so well, uh, well done. Yeah, I had a teacher who, when we studied, so, I mean, she was a very technical teacher, but it was always absolutely focused on the music, so we knew for which piece we were practicing a certain technical aspect. So you didn't work from studies, you worked from we the piece? We did a little bit, but very little, yeah. and yeah. we always knew why we were, you know, we just didn't do studies right. mindlessly. We right. did them to help certain things. You actually have a closer connection to Beethoven, though, and I wondered if you would oblige <laughs> us with the story of your grandfather. All right, the story I've told maybe 200 times, oh. more than my father ever told it. Um, okay, so my father was very tactfully born in Odessa, in Ukraine now, um, in 1917. It's a great time to be born in, in Russia, as it was then. Uh, no problem at all. And then my grandfather got a job in Moscow, so they moved to Moscow. And then Lenin decreed that 12 musicians from the Soviet Union would tour a abroad with their families for six months um, to show the world what a great place for culture the Soviet Union was, which of course it was. But the only slight problem is that not one of the 12 ever went, ever went back. Um, and my grandfather was actually going to come to America. That was his plan, in which case I would not have been born. So. Um, but he gave some successful concerts in Vienna. And people said, why don't you settle here? So he thought he would, at least for a bit. In fact, he stayed until 1938. Well, for some reason, he had to leave. Um, anyway, so... He was looking for an apartment, and my father had this vaguest memory of this 102-year-old housefrau, who was at first very friendly and ruffled his hair. And then my grandfather said, I like the apartment, but I'm a musician. I'll have to practice. Is that OK? No, I hate musicians. He said, well, why do you hate musicians? Because when, my, when I was a little girl, my aunt had a lodger who was a filthy old man who used to spit all over the floor. And I hated him, so I hate musicians. So who was that? Beethoven. <laughs> so my father met somebody who met Beethoven. That's a, mm. that's a pretty amazing connection. Now, music is. was in your family all your life. Your mother taught piano. You have that's a violin true. and a viola, uh, violin and viola playing sisters. That's right. And, Professional musicians. Um, uh, so chamber music started early for you. But when, yeah. did the, when did the cello find you or did you find it? How did the two of you get together? Well, because my father was a very keen amateur violinist, my mother was a piano teacher, as you said, and my elder sister, she didn't, didn't actually play viola at that time. She took it up later, but she always knew she was going to. Almost and nobody begins with the viola. No, she didn't. Oh, she did maybe have six months on the violin when she was about six, but no, then she played piano. But we knew she was going to play viola. And then my middle sister, Rachel, that's Annette, my older sister, my middle sister, Rachel, was playing the violin, so the, and our dog sang, so we needed a cellist. And so I was taken along for a cello lesson at so the age of six. It was just brought to you, and so well, you I played was brought this? brought to it, yes. No, it wasn't a Stradivarius at my first lesson at the age of right. six, no. <laughs> I think I can honestly say that. <laughs> so um, so it was, a, it was a, a, an arranged marriage, we could say? Yeah, yeah, it was. But, you know, as we know, they always work. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you're yes. certainly, you're, you're certainly yes. did, but you weren't really committed to it until you were, what, 10 or 11 years old? Well, I think... I became committed to it when it became increasingly clear that I wasn't any good at anything else. <laughs> it's a very persuasive <laughs> argument to become a cellist. Um, yeah. And then yeah. you studied in England, and then I you did. came to the United States for a couple of years and studied at Oberlin. Oberlin College, yes. Why Oberlin? And was that your first exposure to American culture? Was that your first Yes. Exposure? It was, um, well, what was, I was going to go to Los Angeles to study with the great Gregor Piatigorsky. But um, rather than teach me, he died that summer. So um, you had to make other plans. So I was stuck. Yeah. And then um, a great friend of mine, wonderful cellist, um, Steve Doan, 
he was happened to be staying. In fact, he'd been living with my family for eight months. And he said, I can get you into my alma mater. And I, said, I had all this money. So I said, OK, I'd never heard of Oberlin. He said, you, actually, what persuaded me, he said, you can, um, you can see all the Marx Brothers films, all night showings every week, which was a lie. <laughs> but that's what <laughs> persuaded me. And um, so I went. And I must say, my first ever experience of America, OK, I flew from London to New York. And then I had a few hours in, at JFK. And I had no money. And I was waiting for hours. I had no cash at all. And I sat in a cafe there, just rather miserably. And they brought me water. And then people started giving me food from around that. And I thought, American hospitality. It's good. It's good. <laughs> That's terrific. That's terrific. All right. Well, one of your musical idols is a, is a cellist who might be better known um, than he is, uh, a man named Daniel Shafran. Yeah. Same generation as Rostropovich. Yes, four years older. But right. Rostropovich has the bigger reputation. So why is Shafran so great? And why don't we know him better? <laughs> Rostropovich was a much better politician, much better. And he was also, what Rostropovich did for us was produce a repertoire. I mean, the, you know, Casals is my perhaps ultimate hero among cellists, but Rostropovich did much more for the repertoire. You know, he doubled the amount of masterpieces. So we're incredibly grateful. And he was so charismatic, this Rostropovich. You just couldn't resist him. I knew him a bit. I even played with him. And... Um, you know, he just walked into a room and the room lit up. Mm. Shafran wasn't like that. He was, he was shy, he was nervous, almost neurotic. For her. But his playing is just, I mean, at his best. At his worst, it can be pretty extreme. Um, but at his best, he's just like this Russian folk singer. It's just so natural. Everything is so easy for him. And it's, I find it so incredibly touching. And I just fell in love with his playing when I was about 12, I think 11 or 12. Became obsessed, too obsessed. And then later, I mean, what's nice about you know, becoming sort of slightly better known is that you get to meet your heroes. And um, is, that all, is that a good thing? Sometimes it's a I great suppose. thing. Yeah. It's, I'm no, I don't think I've ever yet been disappointed. I don't think. Um, and I've often had my worst fears confirmed about non-heroes, <laughs> but that's different. Um, but no, my hero, or Shafran, I mean, you know, there was a language barrier. I speak a tiny bit. I saw two-year-old's Russian. But we sort of managed to communicate. But first of all, I interviewed him for the Strad in, um, I don't remember, 1980 or something. But then I was, my, it sort of becomes a club if you love Shafran's playing. I remember Stephen Huff sort of very nervously said, one of our early meetings said, do you by any chance like the playing of Daniel Shafran? I said, yes. And also my friend Oli Mustanen, who's a Finnish pianist and composer, he adored Shafran. It was, again, one of the first bonds between us. And he and I were sitting at my home, he was staying with me, and we were sitting watching a video. I said, oh, God, I'll never hear him live. And he thought, and he said, why not? We can bring him over here. And so what happened, it was a long process, but we brought him over to play at the Wigmore Hall. It was his first appearance for 30 years in London. And, oh, God, I mean, what a night. I mean, it was extraordinary. By then, he was playing was very, very eccentric, but there were some incredible moments. And then I went backstage. I had met him, of course, that once before, but, but I just suddenly didn't dare go up to him. My parents were there. He'd actually, I'd been away, and he'd gone to dinner with them and talked Russian with my father. Um, but I suddenly didn't dare. They had to introduce me, and he gave me this big hug, and we went for a dinner, for Chinese dinner. And that's the only time in my life I've ever forgotten to eat my food. I just, I was so focused on him. I actually they had to take it away in the end. I didn't even notice them taking it away. I mean, that would be a trauma normally. Uh, but um, with him. And then the next year, somebody else brought him back without asking me. I wasn't very pleased because they brought him back on a date. I had to be away. But um, then I wrote, wrote to his agents and invited him for dinner the two nights before the concert. And I didn't hear back, so that was not happening. And then I was away somewhere else. I came back and... And we suddenly got a phone call. Yes, miss, what time do you want, Mr. Shafran? 7 or 7.30? <laughs> and my wife at the time, um, Pauline, she had to quickly to make a dinner. And then he arrived. And we had dinner. And he met my son, Gabriel. And, and you ate that night? I did eat, oh, yes. But, you know, it was difficult. <clears throat> we talked a little German, but mostly, mostly Russian. And then it came time for him to leave. And he said, can I order a taxi? And I said, yes. He said, will the taxi driver speak German? I said, no, London taxi drivers don't speak German. So anyway, so we ordered, and he looked a bit dubious, but anyway, we ordered the taxi. 
and Shafran go, and he eventually arrives. The taxi driver and Shafran go, goes out, says, "Sprechen Sie Deutsch?" "Yeah, ja, ein bisschen." <laughs> <laughs> and Shafran looked at me, so it's so obvious. You know? <laughs> and I never saw him again. Sadly, I was in, sort of responsible for his last ever concert, which was in Australia, which was arranged by my great friend Richard Tognetti, who's you know, the leader of the Australian Chamber Orchestra. Had a festival at that time. And that was his last concert, but. I never saw him again. Well, but, but you got to meet your idol. And, and what's great about him, he's getting yeah. more famous since his death. Yeah. I mean, it would be nice if he'd been more famous during his lifetime, but I think he's getting more of a following now well, than you're helping, ever before. You're helping spread it. You have an affinity for cellists of, I don't know, 100 years ago, the early 20th century cellists? Well, musicians, not necessarily cellists. Oh, Casals, certainly. But right. no, it's more violinists and pianists. Well, what is it about sort of those people and the way they made music that... that um, I makes you put them on a It's on a, a huge pedestal. generalization. But I don't put them on a pedestal, but I think there was less pressure to project themselves. They just enjoyed music more. I get the feeling. There's more childlike simplicity in a player like Thibault or Cotto or Sigetti or something. There's this innocence, this simplicity. They're not trying to do anything to the music. They're just letting it speak. And that is my ideal. Right. Have you struggled with the difference between projecting yourself and staying in the music? Has that been a conscious effort for you? No, it's not conscious. You just study the music a lot. I mean, it's like an actor. You want to become the character you're playing. So there's no tension at all between you and them. Yeah, yeah I mean, there's, the funny thing is that the closer you, more closely you observe the composer's markings, the more different you will sound from everybody else, which is odd, but that's true. Yeah, and it's... Um, when people start to sound like each other is because they're imitating each other's performances or records they've heard. But actually, if you look at the music closely, every composer will say you know, something different to you. All great music will say something different to you every time you play it. And the closer you follow, you know, the more you sort of get these messages from composers, the more joy you will have in the music. So the more you all go to the same place, the more different you all sound. Exactly. It's an amazing oh. thing. It's an amazing thing. Um, tell us about your cello, if you would. It's made of wood. Very good. <laughs> Very helpful start. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Um, it is a, it's not my cello. It belongs to the Royal Academy of Music. It is the Marquis de Corporon Stradivarius. Actually, it lived in New York for a long time because it belonged to Zara Nelsova, and actually, whom I loved. And I remember going to visit her twice as she was you know, on a very final illness, and both times the cello was lying next to her. Mm. Of course, I didn't know then I would end up playing it. But it's funny because she came to IMS Prussia Cove, which is the seminar, which I'm director. She came once to our chamber music, and I was, she played something, and I was sitting next to my sort of best friend since I'm 16, since I was 16, David Waterman, and when it finished, he turned and said, that's the cello for you. Wow. Yeah, and there it is. Um, and it's, you, have, you play Baroque music, you, you recorded the, the, the Bach and the viola da gamba sonatas as well. True. Is, and your bow is a modern bow. Is it, is it a, what we would call a modern cello? Is it fitted well, for, do you play it in cello? You change it for Yeah, music? no, it's, it's set up in modern, in the modern way. Right. I mean, the bow I actually played Bach on is early 19th century. So it's, it's a bit late, but right. it's late, but it's earlier than this. Actually, nobody knows who made this one. And it was actually discovered in Vienna by a great friend of mine who just died like two weeks ago, a wonderful cellist called Marius May. And he discovered this bow, and nobody knows who made it. Mm. Uh, it's extraordinary. But yeah, for Bach and sometimes Haydn and Boccherini, I use a, a lighter bow. Right. And, and you do that. What does the lighter bow give you in that music? It just, it's, it's less sound, I suppose, but it, it just wants to dance, this bow. It's just sort of, come on, let's have a party. Let's dance. Yeah. It just wants to come off the string. Yeah. You have been um, a curator of a number of projects. You did uh, some wonderful things at, at, again, the Wigmore Hall in London um, for the World War I. How do you know they were wonderful? And two. Uh, word travels. Uh, okay. Word travels. All right. We can't believe what people say. We do it. We do know it was true. Um, and uh, you've already told us a couple of wonderful stories, but I'd like you to tell us about the story in the Yana Czech that you're going to play. Yana Czech. Yes. yes. I was the, telling Shai earlier. Charles McCarris said you have to pronounce it eighth note and dotted quarter note, Janáček, <laughs> which I'm never going to do. It's Janáček for me. But, you know. um, okay. Well, his piece is Pohádka. Pohádka. Right. Uh, yes, a fairy tale. Well, as I understand it, which is probably wrong, but it was what I was told, um, this is based on a, well, it is definitely based on a tale by Zukovsky, the Russian 
writer, sort of children's tale. And yeah, it's about it's about sort of basically about the Prince Ivan, lovely Prince Ivan, and the beautiful Princess Maria, who meet and fall in love. And basically, um, Ivan is played by the cello, and Princess Maria is played by Shai Wozner. <laughs> We're looking for a new casting director. Um, <laughs> and anyway, actually, when he first sees her, she's a duck. She's been transformed into a duck, but that's before the st before the piece starts. Um, anyway, you sort of hear the sort of the once upon a time, this magical feel at the beginning, and then you hear Ivan's dotted rhythm. That's I'm sure that's Prince Ivan. Dum ba dum bum bum, and. That's that. And you, then you hear the love duet. But then there's a slight problem to their union, that it turns out that Maria's father is Kastje the undead, king of the underworld. And that's perhaps not the ideal father-in-law. Um, and he himself objects to the ma marriage. He, For some reason, he thinks he owns Ivan's soul. And anyway, he doesn't want his daughter to marry Ivan. And so what you do hear in the music, you hear it getting more intense and um, then you hear a chase on horseback as Kasche chases the lovers. Uh, but they escape. Well, they should escape, but if we mess up our syncopations, they may not. <laughs> but the story goes that they escape, the story I was told. And they get to a neighboring palace, and that's where the second movement begins. And this is wonderful. They, go, they seem to be safe, and there's another Tsar and Tsarina give them shelter. But they want Ivan as a son-in-law for themselves, so they put a spell on him and he falls in love with their daughter. And Maria reacts as any young girl would do, really, under the circumstances. She turns into a blue flower. <laughs> <laughs> it happens a lot. Um, and you can actually hear that. Well, you can hear some things, the transformation of the music um, near the beginning of the second movement. Just gorgeous, delicate music. And luckily, somebody goes and fetches a magician, and he, um, he breaks the spell, and you can hear the dotted rhythm of Ivan coming back. And then eventually, he breaks forth from the spell and is transformed back to himself. Again, there's an alternate version here. If I miss my top B flat, he's transformed into a cat at the top of a tree. <laughs> but that's not really what Janacek intended, I think. <laughs> Um, and then the third moment, they come back and they tell, they get to Ivan's father, who's got a beard that goes down to the ground, by the way, and they tell him and his wife all their adventures, all the fake news that's been happening. And, and then, you know, again, you get the love duet, and then they all live happily ever after. Well, that's a real fairy tale. So all right. Shall I play it? So we'll hear it in music now from Stephen Esserlis and Shai Wasner.
that was just wonderful. Thank fairy, you. A fairy tale. That's nice. Uh, we don't get stories. So Most of us don't get stories told to us that way these uh, days. So it's very yeah. nice. Oh, he's a genius, yeah. and he's a truly original composer. I mean, right. he's, his use of speech rhythms rather than normal, um, just normal musical right. rhythms is right. just so unique. Mm -hmm. And his whole language and how he suddenly goes from huge passion to this melting tenderness. Yeah. He's a true original. Mind you, a bit weird. He was so <laughs> obsessed with speech patterns he was sitting by his daughter's bed as she died and he noted down all the noises she made which i think is weird <laughs> i do have to say uh, it's peculiar i think we can agree on that by the way i was uh, this is why one shouldn't talk and then play it worried me as i was playing in case i given the impression that i didn't think rostopovich was a great great cellist because <laughs> that's rubbish he was an absolute giant of the cello i don't think any of us walked away with the Good. right impression of that point. well nobody else walked away except that's, you that's true that's true <laughs> You have me there once again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do it again, too, in just a minute. Mm. Shai Wasner, pick up that same microphone. Room. Yay! So, I think it's always nice to reassure people that the other musician on stage can speak also. So we want to hear from you. I'm not you. sure. I haven't tried that in a while. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> it's true. So you're, you're playing, as I mentioned, Beethoven. You're doing some nice things with the People's Symphony uh, concerts here in New York. And you have a new album Tell us about the new recording that's coming out uh, next month, April, March? This month, yeah. Okay. I think on the 20th or something like that. Um, well, the, that CD has something to do with Beethoven. It's all Schubert. <laughs> okay. So, you know, it depends on how you see Schubert. I it guess that's right. It does have to do with Schubert worship something. Beethoven. Yeah. This is not the first uh, recording of Schubert you've done. You've spent a lot of time with his, with his yes. big piano work. Well, for two reasons. Um, one, it's great. And the other is that there's just so much of it. We're oh. very lucky, you know. You guys have one sonata. And it's not we even have for cello. Hmm? And it's and not, it's not even, even for cello. cello. No. Mind you, so there's so much, yeah. lots of yours are unfinished. <laughs> <laughs> but 11 are finished, and then some. They're 40 minutes long, so right. each of them. True. Quite, quite a lot of music, yeah. And, and then in May, you're going to be doing a great deal with the piano, except I think you're not playing most of that month. Oh, oh that's right. Well, yes, I'm not. I'm not terribly beneficial to humankind in May. I'm just sitting on a jury at a piano competition. But it's not a small piano competition. No. Shai is going to be a member of the jury at the Queen Elizabeth competition mm -hmm. in Brussels, right. which is a grueling piano competition. Yes. Because Having been on the, other, on the other side, I can assure you it is grueling. Yes. Yeah. You have to learn an original, unpublished work, and the, comp the competitors, uh, I think, are playing a Mozart concerto and then doing a solo recital as well. Right. But, uh, learning the unpublished work is not the grueling part, I have to say. I mean, of course, it depends on the unpublished work. What's, what's the hardest part? I would think a competition like that would be terrifying. It's extremely long, as you said. You, know, you have to be there for at least a month. Um, and, and, <laughs> and you're kind of sequestered, too, as a competitor. Yes. Well, for the week, I think when, when you learn the, the unpublished concerto, um, they send you away. And they feed you really well. <laughs> But that's the only nice thing about it. Oh, um, right. I'm afraid it, you just you spend a week sequestered, like you said. Yeah. Have you done a, Have you done work as a as a jurist, as a as a adjudicator on competitions before? Not much, I have to say. I mean, the only other time that I did a competition like this was was last year in Leeds. Um, but it was a very different experience. It was only two weeks long or something like that, and and much. Yeah, much, much shorter, so. I mean, you're hearing, for the first week, you're hearing two recitals a day, going through all these pianists. How do you possibly hold on to your impressions of each? Is there... You have to take notes. Is there, a, I was going to say... You have to take notes. If you want to be fair, right. you know, to all of them, you really have to take notes, and, and including, you know, blue suit, you know, the, 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 the <laughs> short guy in the red trousers. Right. I mean, really, yeah, right. because... It's impossible to remember. Does that when, affect when it, their marks? Was that? Does that affect their marks? <laughs> <laughs> I try not to. Tan suit, can't have that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's a great honor, but boy, it sounds like a huge challenge to be on a jury like that. Oh, it's, it's nothing compared to being a contestant. <laughs> no, seriously. I, really, I, think, I think all jurors should remind themselves every minute that they sit there on their comfortable sofas or whatever they give them, right. that this is nothing. Um, it, I mean, you, you don't do anything. You just you sit there and you wait for somebody to excite you and to intrigue you and really. Mm. And the interesting thing is that when that happens, you forget everything else. Mm. The rare occasion when somebody really interesting comes along, it can be eight in the evening after, you know, at the end of a whole week of listening to people, 
and you're not tired of it all of a sudden. It's really quite yeah, amazing. Yeah, but then they usually get thrown out in the first round. <laughs> 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 it happened at the Queen Elizabeth competition. Well, Some I'll try I to make sure it doesn't happen again. No, right. you, it's, it's great that you, I mean, I think competition should be banned, but it's great that somebody <laughs> like you is on the jury who actually knows something and doesn't have a student there. Right. No, no students, no. <laughs> No so much, anywhere. So. so much subtext right out in front to them. <laughs> it's really wonderful. Really wonderful. Actually, I was my very last contact with Shafran. Sorry, I don't want to take over. Yeah. It was my very last contact with Shafran. Unfortunately, he asked me to be on the jury of the Tchaikovsky competition, which he was then chairing. And I said, no, because I will not do competitions. I don't approve of them. And he was very offended. Hmm. That was our last contact. Yeah. <laughs> so said, well, Should I'm have said yes. To, I'm sorry to have hmm? brought it Should up. Should have said yes. No, I won't do it. Well, congratulations on the new Schubert album. We'll look yeah, forward yeah, which to that. Sonatas? Which sonatas? Um, the last one, the B flat, um, the C minor, so mm -hmm. third from last, yeah. and G like major eight. and A minor. So all from the last. You mean the last G major? Yes. Wow. Yes. That's a very good piece. That's a, hang on, that's two albums. Yes, it is. Yeah. Well, so we have But nobody buys CDs anymore, so you, know, you might as well call it one album. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> well, I'm sure, it'll, I'm sure it will find its spot on WQXR before very long, too. So we'll look forward to that right. very much. Very Thank much. you. Um, Mr. Isserlis, you have not only you played a great deal. You may call me Stephen. Well, uh, Don't call me you. Henry, but you can call me <laughs> Stephen. <laughs> you are, besides being a great cellist, you are also an author and specifically of some wonderful children's books. Why Beethoven Threw the Stew. Why Handel Waggled His Wig. Those um, are my books for yeah. children. Then I've got one for young musicians as well uh, that I co-wrote with a friend of mine called Robert Schumann. Yeah, with Robert Schumann. Mm -hmm. So... Um, and you do lots of concertizing for, for children. What I used is, to, haven't so much recently, but yes. Um, what's the best way to reach young children with this Not music? to condescend. Children are amazing. They can listen to anything. I mean, you don't sit a, you know, a seven-year-old child and make them listen to a Bruckner symphony. <laughs> I mean, that would be cruel and unusual. But, um, you know, but you just talk to them like for instance when I was playing I had my own series here the 92nd Street Y which are, and we played the first moment of Beethoven's opus 102 number one the fourth sonata the first of the two late sonatas for piano and cello and you know a lot of adult audiences find those very challenging and I just spoke to the children about it and I said for me this represents heaven and then hell and and they listen like angels um, you just have to you know short things, short, uh, short move, I mean, movements, not whole pieces, and put in something with sort of a, you know, a catchy rhythm at some point. But I must say, children, once you get a children's audience, it's just exhilarating. It's wonderful when you got them. I must say, perhaps my favorite ever children's concerts have been in Japan. But that's because they take it so seriously. They all have to do a drawing or write an essay or something before, and then it always gets they get this exhibition. And I've taken I've taken to it at the end and meet all the children. And, but they take it so seriously. I don't know why. The one question has always sort of kept in my head that um, once we were playing Schumann's fantasy pieces, and a girl put up her hand and through the interpretation she said. Um, you're playing such beautiful music, these fantasy pieces by Schumann. What emotions do you feel inside when you play? I found that so touching. I couldn't answer, but it was just so touching. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit better than I gave a concert once at the Wigmore Hall in London. <laughs> I got a letter also from this boy. They all, uh, one class, all sent their letters of their impressions. But again, the one remark stayed in my mind. He said, thank you very much for the concert at the Wigmore Hall last Friday. I couldn't believe how straight the music stands were. <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody's always looking at something. Exactly. People are paying attention. You've also written and produced documentaries, one on Robert Schumann, oh, yeah, and another on one of your great heroes. A surprising, uh, perhaps, choice. But it's Harpo Marx. Yay! Why... Is he your guy? Why is Harpo your guy? I love Harpo. I've always loved Harpo since I first saw him when I was about 15, maybe. Um, I don't know. He's just freedom. He's, I, I don't know why. He's sort of in my mind with Schumann. Both of them are just flying in the air. There's no restriction. They are pure creativity. And I just love Harpo. And I always love Harpo. And I must say, I don't like to boast, but I was rather flattered when Harpo's son, Bill, who's a great friend of mine, 
He said, many people have acted Harper since he died, but you're the first person who's actually been him. <laughs> I think that's the best compliment I've ever got, apart from the straight music stands, of course. <laughs> Well, we can recommend to you, without any reservation, uh, uh, Stephen Isulis' Twitter account. Um, we had some of them up on the screen earlier. You're you did? A, you're a wonderful person on Twitter, wonderful personality. Yes, thank you. You share your insights about music and about musicians. You have and I only quotations. get the occasional trolling. And, God. And, um, but no, normally people are very nice. Yes, that's true. Well, but it, you make that... I did plug my son yesterday. Normally I don't plug anything. and I try to keep it impersonal, but one's allowed to plug one's son's. What was, he, what was he up to? Well, he's got this business in London that sort of finds rehearsal space, not for just for classical musicians, but also for pop musicians, for, for dance companies, for theatre companies, film, film crews, etc. And it's just starting to, he's got over a thousand sign-ups. Oh, my little good. boy! <laughs> so when you do make that awful social media platform a really nice place. Oh, thank you. Say you. Very nice. It's really true. It's really true. Well, we have one more selection from we our do. guests. Our built in encore, because we don't have anything else. Yeah, well, no, it's quite wonderful. We're going to hear some music from Prokofiev's Cello Sonata. Uh, debuted in 1950 by, what was the fellow's name? <laughs> <laughs> Rastropovich. That's right, Rastropovich. And Richter. And, yes, Vyatoslav Richter. It's an interesting piece, because, of course, 1950, 1949, I think it was written, 1948 were the great trials in Moscow where Prokofiev and Shostakovich and others were accused of writing formalist music that wasn't suitable for the people. So Prokofiev's reaction, as far as I can see, he goes and writes this huge sonata for cello and piano in C major, you know, the people's key, and full of these sort of lovely folk tunes that everybody can enjoy. And you could think it was cynical, but I actually don't think it was. I think he's having a great time writing the sonata. And we're going to play the scherzo, which of course is the funniest moment. But the whole piece, I just, I found completely charming and well, touching. You've been absolutely charming in your performance tonight, and so we're going to put you on a charming piece. What about my speaking? And also charming and informative as well. Ah, you're a good man. I like you. So, all right. So Thank once you. again, Stephen Isserlis and Shai Wozner.
thanks to our artists tonight, and we owe enormous thanks to those of you who are supporters of WQXR because all of the events that happen on our radio station and here at the Green Space happen with the help of our listener supporters. So we are so grateful to those of you who support WQXR, indeed. And, uh, and we thank those of you who are watching online tonight and you here with us in the Green Space for these amazing events that bring the music and the musicians just a hair's breadth from you. It's a thrilling experience. Our thanks once again to Shai Wasner and to Stephen Isulis. And we bid you a good night from the Green Space. Thank you. <laughs>